probability and bias in machine learning. So uh, let's greet this awesome guy. Awesome, awesome. <coughs> Um, so, thank you very much for that great uh, introduction. Um, uh, are you able to hear me in the back? All good? Awesome, perfect. So, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here today at the PyCon Belarus. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, a practical guide towards uh, explainability and bias uh, in machine learning. As it was mentioned, I am the Chief Scientist at, at the Institute for Ethical AI and Machine Learning, and I'm also a contributing uh, researcher for several industry standards on algorithmic bias and risk assessments uh, for uh, industry uh, AI deployments. And uh, today what we're going to be covering is a hands-on example, a fictitious example with this company that we're going to call Hype ML. And uh, what we're going to be doing is we're going to perform the automation of a loan approval process. Uh, we're then going to discuss the terminology uh, and why it's not just about removing bias. Uh, then we're going to uh, deep, uh, dive deep with this uh, XAI library. Uh, which is a practical framework to mitigate, not remove, not fully remove bias. And then we're going to apply this uh, framework to our example. So let's do this. Uh, we're going to be using uh, this library called XAI, which uh, the Institute maintains. Uh, it's available and you can check it out. Feel free to contribute with uh, issues or pull requests. So let's take on this situation. HypeML suddenly gets a new project uh, where business is super excited because an insurance company has requested to automate an internal process where they have a lot of domain experts reviewing loan applications and either approving them or rejecting them. They receive over 1 million applications over a year, so they want to automate the process. And business wants it right now or yesterday, if possible. They heard some competitors using this machine learning thing, so they definitely want to have that uh, fully shiny uh, thing in place. So the team, the Hype ML company, had a look at what uh, the machine learning standard workflow looked like. And they realized that what it looks like is, you know, getting some data, uh, defining some features, selecting the model and uh, the hyperparameters, and then with some scoring framework, uh, scoring uh, metrics, uh, iterate until they're happy. Once they're happy with the performance of the model, they put it in production so that it, per it performs inference on unseen data. And that's what they basically saw. So that's what they went to do. So they asked for data. Business came back with an Excel file with 25 rows. And they were like, we cannot do anything with this. So HypeML managed to convince them to get uh, an Excel file with label data, uh, historical data of, of 8,000 rows. So then it begun, the journey towards greatness, the HypeML journey towards greatness. So we basically get this initial data set. And as we see, we have uh, 13 features consisting on things such as age, working class, education, gender, ethnicity, and whether the loan was approved or rejected. We have 8,000 uh, different uh, um, um, uh, examples uh, with the 14 different features, including the, um, the label, the target label. And um, we perform the usual process. We split our data into train and validation. Uh, we have 6,000 on the, on the training and then 1,600 on the validation. And then what we do is we just take a model, a single layer uh, uh, with 100 neurons, and we train it. Uh, the model has a softmax layer at the end, which means that the output is going to be a probability between 0 and 1. If it's over 0 0.5, then the loan is approved, otherwise rejected. Right, and we train this model. Um, when we evaluate it, we see that we get 98.7% accuracy. So our initial accuracy was almost 99%. So what better result on a Friday evening? So let's ask over here, who thinks that it's a good accuracy and we should push it to production? Let's see a show of hands. Nice, nice, some cowboys in this room. Perfect, so we push to production, and then a few, a few weeks go by, and suddenly BuzzFeed News pushes a, an article, HypeML deploys racist, sexist AI, and you know, the whole HypeML team is sitting there going, but we followed the instructions in the internet, how could this happen? 
And with this very, very simplified uh, example, what they did is uh, they went back and, and they diagnosed. So they asked business to gather 100, uh, the 110 examples that uh, were processed in production and label them so that they can actually see what the performance of the model actually was. And when they actually um, uh, received it, you know, as, as I mentioned, there's 110 examples with the 13 columns and then the label of whether it was approved or rejected. Um, and when we actually evaluate our model, we see that we have a 54% accuracy on this data that we saw in production. And when we actually get a, a deeper insight into a uh, confusion matrix where we see the number of expected approve and the predictive approve, we see that the model, what it was doing, it was just rejecting everything, right? It was, it, it was getting an application rejected, no matter what, just rejecting everything. And we can see this, that everything was going into rejected. And the team was sitting there like, why? Okay, let's actually see more metrics, like our ROC curve, which tells you whether your model uh, performs better than randomness. And we can see that our model performs exactly like randomness. So we could have just deployed a function that returns random, and it would have performed probably around the same level. And when we actually uh, visualize the data set in training and what we actually saw in production, we saw that the training data, we had a lot of examples for rejected, but very few for approved. And in the production data set, we actually have several that were supposed to be accepted, but they were all just rejected, right? And in, the, in this very simplified example, we've actually seen um, uh, an overview of this uh, topic of undesired bias and the need for explainability. And you know this topic has become popular because of the high-profile incidents like Amazon's sexist recruitment tool or Microsoft's racist chatbot or negative discrimination in automated sentencing and other 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 cases where black box models uh, with uh, that learn a lot of complex patterns uh, you know that cannot be inter inter interpretable. And the, the thing that we have noticed is that organizations often don't go uh, 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 and are afraid to use these emerging technologies, not because of the risks, but because of the unknown risks. And the fact that they see these high profile incidents happening in front of their eyes, thinking, oh my God, that's, that's going to happen to me. So um, the reason why this is also very challenging is because um, you know, this, this, this problem needs people to see it beyond an algorithmic challenge, right? Large ethical considerations should not just fall on the shoulders of a single data scientist. And the way that we tend to uh, explain why this is such a complex problem is because you have the technical area, this intersection of data scientists, software engineering, and DevOps engineering creating this machine learning engineering uh, field or role, which takes best practices from each of these fields. However, in practice, often you have data scientists that are deploying code into production, but perhaps are not following best practices from software engineering. Or vice versa, you have software engineers that build models and they don't actually use statistical metrics beyond accuracy, which are best practices within data science. And one, uh, uh, even, even if, if this is already hard enough, when we take this ambiguous field of machine learning engineering and we take it into industry, you find this intersection of machine learning engineering, industry domain expertise, and policymakers, right? And they're all trying to work together to come up with industry standards or means to be able to reduce risk and introduce accountability. And there's a lot of good work happening in this sort of areas, but it's in isolation. What needs to happen is to make sure that there is that cross collaboration between the technical sort of like intersections and the industry uh, 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 challenges that are being faced. And this is something that needs to go beyond industry. It needs to also be something that happens in research. There's a lot of research papers that try to tackle this issue of uh, explainability and bias, but often it only has the technical insights and doesn't bring that domain expertise. So it's important to make sure um, that there is that perspective and that input from cross-functional uh, uh, sets of, of people. That's why at the Institute we work with ethicists, psychologists, et cetera, et cetera in the industry domain experts to be able to bring their best practices. And the answer is not just about removing bias, right? Because any non-trivial decision, i.e. that has one more, m more than one option, will have an inherent bias without exceptions. Un unless you deploy a machine learning model whose only response is maybe, you will have an inherent bias within there, right? In machine learning, you're trying to discriminate towards the right answer. 
and the, the, the difference within your statistical error, that's already something that is considered as bias. When you go beyond st uh, uh, statistical bias, when you talk about societal bias, that is challenging because societal bias itself is inherently biased. What that means is that um, something that someone may consider as racist or sexist, someone else in another location may not consider that is uh, racist or sexist, right? So it is a challenging thing that is temporally based and it, it, however, it still needs to be tackled. So let's see what undesired bias actually looks like. Um, the way that we see it is in two sections. It's before the project begins and once the project starts and the sessions are made. So before the project begins, these are errors in scope or bias a priori. These are suboptimal business objectives, lack of understanding of the project. This is incomplete resources such as not enough data or not enough time, um, incorrect label data. This could potentially be data that was labeled correctly for 20 years ago, but is no longer considered as labeled correctly. Um, lack of relevant skill sets within the teams or societal shifts in perception, right? So this is once the project begins, what are already the constraints that uh, make the project uh, be biased from the, from the ideal. And the second one is once, once the project begins, the, the bias a posteriori, every decision that is made throughout the delivery of the project, every decision made to choose a model, to choose the features, to choose the accuracy metrics, there is potential errors introduced within there that introduce that statistical uh, 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 divergence between the ideal that you could get and what you actually obtain. And it's also important to uh, make sure we remember that explainability doesn't equal interpretability, right? You can have interpretability into a machine learning model, but that doesn't mean that you can explain the predictions. And that's why it's important to introduce uh, this, this uh, ability to uh, remove or mitigate undesired bias through a combination of tools and process, right? And the way that, that we break it down is, you know, it's focusing on processes and best practices. Like in cybersecurity, you know, it's impossible to avoid all hacking attacks, right? It's, it's impossible. But by introducing best practices, you can mitigate at least uh, a few by make sure, making sure that your infrastructure and your processes are in place. Similarly, it's impossible to just remove undesired bias completely, but it's possible to introduce a process that introduces accountability and mitigates basic uh, 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 um, divergences. Um, you know, using the right tools with the right domain experts, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of numerous techniques that can be used in best practices within data science, but it's about sitting down with the experts that understand the field and would be able to tell you how a specific correlation or a specific uh, uh, feature importance really reflects in practice in that field, right? And ensuring that humans are leveraged, right? There, there can be a difference between deploying a model that is um, performing predictions by itself or introducing a human in the loop review at the very end to uh, make sure that the risks are reduced, right? And this depends on the, on, the, on, the, on the risks within the process. And how it actually looks like, it's taking this existing uh, data science process that, that is known by everyone uh, uh, or most people in this, in this room, and introduce three key steps. This, the three steps are number one, data analysis aligned with the business objectives. And this requires assessment of class imbalances, things like protected features, uh, correlations within the data, data representability. The second one is on model analysis and model evaluation. So this is understanding feature importance, you know, using model specific explainability methods, you know, using domain knowledge abstraction, what are the patterns that the model learned that then could actually be uh, explained by a domain expert and perhaps be introduced as features a priori to the model, right? So you, you, you remove some of the complexity from the model itself. And the last one is production monitoring. And this is important because as soon as you put a model into production, it starts to deteriorate. Right? Similar to a piece of technology that you know, starts becoming more legacy. But in, 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 in data science and especially in machine learning, when you put a model in production, you may, you may actually see divergence due to the temporal nature of data, for example. If you have a fin financial data set, uh, uh, things like inflation may affect the model that was already trained. Right? So it needs to, uh, you need to make sure that you set the right metrics to monitor 
the models that you put in production in the short term and in the long term. And what this looks like into our model is basically you get your data and then you perform data analysis with the right tools and the right domain experts. When you train your model, you assess and evaluate the performance of the model as well as metrics. And we're going to see how that looks like. And then you set the metrics to then be able to monitor within production. Right? This requires maturity in the infrastructure in order for you to be able to do that. And this is why it's important to understand that there's an explainability trade-off. And um, uh, you know, introducing fail-safe mechanisms, uh, you know, removing features or introducing simpler models can have an impact on accuracy. Right? And not all use cases de demand the same level of scrutiny. Right? Like building a prototype uh, may not require the same level uh, of processes introduced than automating a recruitment process at scale with uh, hundreds of thousands of, of people interacting with it. Right? And um, you know, the ones that are more critical require more scrutiny, more explainability, more interpretability. And similar to enterprise software, yes, it introduces a level of red tape that may slow down development. But when you, de when you develop um, um, enterprise-ready systems, they require much more uh, a, a heavier infrastructure around uh, the systems themselves. So it's not just the piece of technology, it's the everything that comes around it. And um, there's many tools available for this. Uh, there's uh, XAI, which is the one I mentioned. There's also SHAP, Lime, ELI5. And we actually created a list uh, called the Awesome Machine Learning Operations List that you can check uh, online. Uh, which has not only explainability and predi for prediction and models, but also things like privacy preser preserving machine learning, etc. One of the things that I forgot to mention actually is that uh, the the link is on on the uh, uh, corner of the of this of the slides. If you access it, you can uh, get access to all the links. And um, yeah, so let's jump into it. Let's go back into our example and see how these three steps actually look like. And let's start with data analysis. So with data analysis, what we're going to do is we're going to first import the, the XAI library. And what, we're, what we will uh, manage to do now is we're going to take uh, the initial data set and um, you know, see uh, what we have, which is a, a similar one. Uh, we're going to then be able to use this library to understand and analyze the data sets. In this case, we want to analyze how the data set breaks down in the gender uh, 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 feature. right? And what we can see is that um, we can visualize some of the imbalances, the number of examples that we have for each of the genders within the data set. So here we can see that we have over uh, 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 double of uh, examples on, on male than, than with female. Um, the second one you know, is when we visualize as a breakdown is that even though we, we now have more examples, when we break it down by our target feature loan, we can see that the number of examples for uh, approved female are very, very few. Right? So even though it actually looked like it was slightly more balanced, we would still, um, uh, if trained the model with this data set, the model would still be trained with those imbalances. And again, remember, it's not about making sure everything is completely balanced. It's about being uh, uh, conscious of what are the initial imbalances that your data set has and having the right uh, people with the right skill sets to make sure that they, they can have their, uh, uh, their say on whether this is a representative data set for what will be seen in production. Um, what we can do now with this library, you actually can use up sampling and down sampling to balance a data set. So what we're basically doing here is we're saying that for the um, uh, gender with a cross of the target function loan, uh, uh, we want to up sample all of the data points that are less than 0.5 up to 50%, uh, uh, right? And we want to downsample all of the ones. We can, for example, remove the downsampling, and we can see that the ones for uh, male uh, rejected you know, are still higher. So it, it just allows you to play around with um, some of the features by using upsampling and downsampling. What you can do as well is you can define what are your protected features, things that perhaps you wouldn't use to train in your model, but still would like to understand breakdowns of the, um, uh, the, the data set that you have. And in this case, we're seeing uh, the imbalances within ethnicity. You know, we, we can see that we have more examples for one class than the other. For age, you know, we have less examples for people over than 60, etc., etc. Um, and then we can also visualize the correlations. So here we're actually visualizing the correlations in a dendrogram. Uh, we can see things like, uh, you know, native country and ethnicity are, um, you know, are quite correlated or marital status and relationship. 
you know, with this perspective, we know that if we remove one of those and we still keep the other one, the, the model will still be able to infer um, some of those uh, patterns when seeing the inference. Again, it's not about just removing everything from the model. It's about being conscious and being able to monitor in production w when you have this, you know, potential high profile uh, screw ups. Um, and then you can also visualize it on a uh, matrix perspective. This is just your usual uh, correlations matrix. What we're going to do now is um, be able to do a balanced cross uh, 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 um, uh, test uh, train split, right? So when you actually split your data set, one of the mo most important things is to create your validation data set, the data set that you're going to use to to quantify the performance of the model. And for this perspective, you would want to make sure that it's as close as possible to what you will see in production. Again, this is not to be the superhero and state what society should look like, but this is to be able to uh, make those decisions, not just with one data scientist, but with the right domain experts. Um, now we, we jump into the next part, which is model analysis, model evaluation. And what we can do here, we're going to start by training our data set with uh, this, um, sorry, our training our model, the sa same sort of like structure with the data set that we have. Um, we can see that here it doesn't just jump into a, a, a high accuracy very, very fast because it's probably not just learning to reject everything, which is, you know, sometimes a good thing. And uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to visualize how this new model performs. And we can see that now at least it has a much more reasonable um, uh, balance when it comes to approved or rejected loans. It's not just rejecting everything. It's getting a few uh, more accurate when comparing it with our um, sample validation set. When we visualize the ROC curve, we can see that it performs significantly better than randomness, which is always a good thing. And what is interesting is that this library allows you to visualize things like your ROC curves on a feature-specific basis. So what we're going to do here is we're going to visualize and create an ROC curve for each of the genders and see how that actually performs. So in this case, we can see that um, you know, the, the, the ROC curve for male versus female perhaps in some other sample could be heavily, uh, th uh, th there could be a heavy disparity, right? So it's just to be conscious of the performance of the model itself. Uh, other thing that we can do is actually run um, uh, an understanding of, of metrics. So in this case, we're visualizing the precision, recall, specificity, and accuracy of the model. But what we can do is actually see the things like precision and recall for the feature itself. So you can actually see uh, how the, the, the precision, recall, specificity, et cetera, performs for each of the genders. And this, again, is to make sure um, that you're conscious of potential divergences within the, the trained model itself, right? It's not about making sure that it's exact, because what does that even mean, right? But it's about making sure that now you can have those conversations with the right domain experts. Normally, it's not going to be as simple as just um, an obvious, uh, you know, sort of like protected features that just screams, you know, gender. With the, with, the, with the case with Amazon, what happened is that the, the model learned to use the gaps between employment to uh, automatically reject uh, potential candidates. And what that, that meant is that uh, women that had maternity leave were automatically rejected, right? So it's then understanding how those biases get introduced and being able to mitigate it before TechCrunch, you know, gets you a headline saying that you made it on purpose and you're the evil genius that, you know, deploys racist models. Um, and, um, you know, we, what we can do as well is we can actually do feature importance, doing feature permutations. These are just techniques that uh, we compiled into this one library, but it, it's everything about, you know, being able to have the right tools to sit down with the right stakeholders. In this case, we can actually visualize that things like capital gain, marital status have the, the, the biggest importance when it comes to performing inference into uh, uh, our, uh, uh, in, in, in our model. And we can also see that our protected features, you know, gender, ethnicity, uh, you know, don't perform, are not as strong uh, uh, in terms of importance as others are. And um, what we can do as well is we can use other libraries like SHAP, SHAP is basically using uh, shapely values that allow you to take for one specific prediction how each of the features affects uh, that sort of uh, uh, um, um, probability at the end. So in this case, the probability that we got was around um, uh, 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 0.17. 
and we can see that the fact that it's education number 13 it pushed it up by that much right and marital status never married pushed it down uh, about that much right so we can see the importance for each of the of the predictions and again this is about sitting down and being able to use this in information um, to to make sure that your uh, entire process is more robust so it's a combination of interpretability methods for machine learning but also is using that domain expertise we can also use lime which is another technique uh, similar to sharp uh, SHAP is, is, is an improved uh, sort of version. LIME uses uh, local approximations, uh, which is a quite an interesting area. And you can still very similarly see how each of the uh, features affects uh, for that specific inference that, that we performed. Um, and then for the last piece, production monitoring. So this is about setting metrics for you to be able to ensure that the models that you put in production perform as expected. And you can actually set metrics that you can test on a short period of time versus a longer period of time. Some of these tech companies, if they had actually set some metrics up front, of course it introduces uh, 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 more red tape and it, it slows down potential uh, uh, deployment of, of the systems, but it avoids those high profile scandals by making sure somebody checks within a specific period of time or you get notified. In this case, what we created is uh, this um, visualization that we called uh, the smile graph, uh, which what basically it shows is the number of predictions that fall into the uh, probabilities, right? So here is all of the uh, predictions that fall in a probability bu uh, bucket of 0 to uh, 0 0.1, uh, 0 0.2, etc., etc. What that means is that if it's over 0.5, uh, it's going to be an approved loan and it's either correct or incorrect. If it's lower, then uh, again, it's going to be rejected and it's either correct or incorrect. So that's what you're seeing here. And um, w you can actually see it into more uh, detail uh, by uh, showing the uh, display breakdown. So basically is the true positives, true negatives, false positives, false negatives, um, seeing wh wh where your probability lies. And the interesting thing about this curve and the reason why, why we show it is because it allows you to ask questions such as, how would my model perform if we introduce manual review process upon a specific uh, certainty when the model actually uh, uh, provides, say, for example, 70% certainty that the loan should be approved? Um, you can see that all of the green stuff is what would uh, be processed through a manu manual review. Right, so what you're saying is that humans would look at anything that goes within these areas. Of course, it's not just about just pushing this because it, it still needs to answer the question of, well, what does it mean to have 0.7 uh, 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 per, uh, or 70 percent uh, uh, probability, right? You have to understand what that really means on your specific use case. And um, with that said, you know, revisiting our workflow, uh, we can see that these three steps allow us to not remove bias, but actually introduce the right steps with the right stakeholders to have those conversations to understand what are the potential risks. And this is, this is something um, that we're abstracting into what is now becoming industry standards like the ISO uh, 20XXX that allows you to actually uh, uh, certify yourself that not you're completely uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, never going to be uh, having biases, but instead is that you have the processes to mitigate them. And with that said, um, th this was an overview of uh, you know, explainability bias evaluation from a practical perspective with an example on a loan approval process. Again, the code, uh, you can find it on bit.ly slash PyConXAI. And um, yeah, uh, thank you very much and happy to take questions now or later at the pub. Thank you. Let's start with questions. Awesome. Uh, can you return to the slide where you have a uh, dendrogram of features? Oh uh, yes, I'll just change it to the Jupyter. Uh, yep. So, uh, yes, uh, there is uh, teacher's gender and it is uh, highly correlated correl correl with uh, hours per week. It's, uh, as I understand, it's how many hours per week uh, person work, yes? Oh, yeah, yes. So it means that if we decide don't be uh, sexist and uh, say that uh, we do not uh, have gender features at all, uh, our model uh, will get uh, uh, who men and who women just based on hours per week. So that is correct. We have uh, BuzzFeed news that said we are sexist anyway. 
Well, so um, that's a very good question. No, a very, very good question. So again, I think it's, it's worth emphasizing um, that, you know, the purpose is not to say you have to remove any sort of uh, preconception on uh, any protected feature because that is always going to be impossible. There's always uh, features that are going to be uh, at least slightly dependent. And uh, one of the main things to mention as well is that this data set is from the 1970s. It was just taken for, for this. But specifically to your question, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a really good point. The main uh, perspective is not that it should be removed, but the decision shouldn't just be left to the data scientist to say, I'm going to remove it or I'm going to leave it. It should be a decision for the process uh, from end to end based on how the current humans process it. Right, so in a, in, a, in a recruitment process that has no AI uh, at this point in time may not allow the person to, understand, uh, to use things like gender to base their opinion. However, that doesn't mean that companies don't still do their best to try to identify things that allow them to maximize for the candidates. Um, ultimately, you know, it's never going to be possible to remove all that, but it's about making sure that the right people make the decisions of what needs to be removed and to what extent and what to monitor to avoid potential uh, discriminations. Again, there's the, the perspective of, well, if I train the model, should it positively discriminate? And that's another really hard question. That's something that, you know, it's not just uh, be taken lightly and a software engineer just changes the weights of the model. It's something that needs to be consciously done throughout the actual end-to-end -end process. Uh, but that's a, that's, a, that's a very good point. It's domain specific. Uh, it's going to be a bit of a long question, so apologies in advance. But awesome. uh, no worries. So, um, I've seen commonly in the, both in the academic environment and in, in industrial environment and policy making that uh, bias and discrimination and fairness in machine learning is often discussed um, in terms of model predictions. But uh, an AI system typically does not end with model predictions. So like model predictions affect decision making and decision making affects the underlying population. And it's quite common for uh, for the model to actually change its data under its own feet over time. And there was a very interesting uh, published paper that got the best paper award that, at the latest ICML. It was about uh, a situation uh, where the group of the researchers tried to not only focus on model predictions, but actually monitor the monitor a particular metric over time, like to measure the temporal uh, effect of deploying a model into production. And they found a very interesting case on American uh, FICO data set credit scoring that enforcing any kind of uh, fairness constraints actually actively harmed both the institution and the demographic group it aimed to protect. So it sometimes can happen that like, Common common sense tells us to uh, to have maybe like equal opportunity or demographic parity across some of the sensitive features, but in the end, shouldn't the result of a fairness framework be to not harm everyone? So I was wondering if you have any thoughts on uh, like whether the policy making around this should change and how to adopt the ethical framework to uh, go from just uh, point predictions to actually the temporal effect over a long period of time. Yes, that's that's a very very good question and. Um, I think that, that that is one of the, the, the biggest issues um, that you know we're trying to portray here is that bias is, is, is not really just an algorithmic problem and it's not just something that can be tackled by removing features and, and just modify um, especially not just modifying weights. It's something that needs to be tackled throughout the end-to-end -end process that not just involves the deployment but also the temporal nature of that process itself. And you know that's why when when um, you know proposing this um, uh, sort of like data science extension, it, it it involves not just the perspective of data analysis and model evaluation, but also setting the metrics both in short and long term to monitor not just divergences of like statistical metrics of the model, but also potential uh, reinforcement of the discrimination within the industry itself. Because sometimes you see that the deployment of a model could have a negative effect on the already uh, uh, already uh, uh, um, sort of um, uh, disjoint uh, or imbalanced uh, uh, crowd in, in which it's being used. So I think, I think it's just the, the perspective of how can we make sure that we tackle this not by just introducing tools, but by making sure that the, the right policymakers, right regulators are at each point in time. And also one of the other questions that uh, needs to be introduced is in what extent policy stops and standards begin 
and then at what point standards finish and best practices in software engineering and data science begin, right? Because then you need to be able to use uh, basic terms within the legal sphere, like things like negligence, right? To be able to say, well, what is the level of accountability of, for example, why did something go wrong, right? How do you pinpoint that to? So it, it, that's a very, very good point is how do you convert this into not an algorithmic problem, but a human, uh, a long-term sort of problem? Mm -hmm. We have time for one more question. I have one question. Hi, Alejandro. Cheers for this talk. Um, in the beginning, you've mentioned a really interesting question. You said that sometimes we have a problem when software engineers developing the machine learning models and when data scientists pushing it to production, right? Mm -hmm. It's a really interesting question. At the same time, you in introduction, you said that you have a great experience in creating from scratch data science teams, right? Yep. So let's say this virtual bank from the beginning of your talk came up to you as a consultant and you've got a budget for 10 people. How would you split these 10 people between data scientists, software engineers and DevOps? Do you have an answer for that? Wow. Um, no, that's a very, very good question. That's a very good question. So uh, unfortunately, there is no, um, you know, like specific percentage because that depends on the nature of the project if it's b2b you need more people in the uh you know professional services sort of like integration data engineering if it's if it's more like in-house b2c you may need more people to focus on the infrastructure like cloud sort of DevOps. so it's it would be different but something that i've actually been seeing been seeing that is quite interesting is that there needs to be more focus than there currently is on the roles that require infrastructure when it comes to data engineering, especially, uh, that is a field that is already quite um, um, uh, misunderstood, right? You see, you, you can see it in like, if you see a job application for a machine learning engineer or a data engineer, they're trying to hire somebody with data science skills, software engineering skills, perfect consultant skills for the, for the salary of an intern, right? So, which is completely impossible. This is something that is already opening up to the, to the problem, which is you can't just hire a superhero, a unicorn, to just do everything, right? It's how, th how can you make sure that you have the right people at the right time? The one thing that you're correct is that you do need um, this, this uh, combination of skills. So you will need data engineers, DevOps, software engineers, or full stacks. Uh, the ratio will depend on the nature of the project. But I think it's just coming into the realization that we need it. And that's why, you know, one of the, the core things that, that I do mention and that I encourage is this machine learning operations sort of set of libraries. These are things that go beyond just the TensorFlow, right? It's things that you can use to orchestrate models, to uh, do automated feature engineering, automated uh, uh, neural search or, you know, visualization to explain things. So it's things that are required based on the job. Um, but I think the, the, the one answer that I can just say is that you will need uh, uh, all of those skill sets. Cheers. Thanks. Yeah, but really good question. But okay, the last one, if I have one last second. Would you hire a data scientist who turned into data science after being software engineer? Um, yeah, of course. I think, I think uh, it's, it's similarly like there's, there's people that, that come from one field and become uh, in the other. I think it's just on defining what are the requirements for these roles. And I think that is what is the tougher thing to say is, you know, what do you need in order for that transition to be taken in a reasonable way. Thank you. Okay, let's thank Alejandro. Awesome, thank you very much guys, thank you. So, it was a great talk and we will have like two minutes technical uh, uh, to meet our next speaker. Please do